Hi there, I'm Jordan. I know you're thirsty, so let's talk about the wines of Chateauneuf-du-Pape and the surrounding area of the Southern Rhone. So when we look at the Southern Rhone, it's important to know that it hasn't actually been part of France for that long, historically speaking. It's like that country on the risk board that everyone takes turns invading just to get a risk card. Since antiquity, the Southern Rhone has been invaded by the Romans, the Carthaginians, the Visigoths, the Saracens, the Knights Templar, the French Crown, the French Revolutionaries, and probably like orcs. But the reason that it's an important region for wine is almost entirely because of one historical period, and that's the Avignon Papacy. So due to some political skullduggery by King Philip of France, Pope Benedict XI moved the seat of the Catholic Church from Rome to Avignon, where it stayed for almost 70 years through seven popes. Eventually, the last Avignon Pope, Urban VI, he moved the church back to Rome, but when he died, both Avignon and Rome continued to elect their own popes, which became what's called the Western Catholic Schism, where the Pope in Avignon was like, I'm the real Pope, and the Pope in Rome was like, no, I'm the real Pope, you're the anti-Pope. And then the French guy was like, anti-Pope? No way, you're the anti-Pope. The Romans guy, I can't be the anti-Pope because I'm in Rome, anti-Pope. And so on and so on. But don't worry, they worked it out, everything was fine. I'm kidding, it lasted 40 years. But why this period is important to us is because wherever the Catholic Church goes, so does viticulture. The Catholic Church, by way of missionaries, is how winemaking spread to almost every New World region. See, wherever they went, they planted vines. It's why we're making wine from grapes in BC instead of some weird-ass apple salmonberry cider. But the problem was that from a wine-growing point of view, Avignon was horrible. It was low-lying on a floodplain, it was humid and it regularly flooded, so these are not ideal conditions. But remember, the church needs wine for sacraments, so they had to find somewhere. And that somewhere ended up being about 18 kilometers to the north. It was still along the Rhone River, but the land was drier and the hills gave you good drainage and, and southern exposure. It was perfect for wine growing, and as a bonus, there was a castle on top. Now in France, this is not particularly unique. Um, they don't usually let a hill not have a castle on it. Uh, when you first start driving around the, the Rhone Valley, uh, you see a castle and you start imagining the story of who owned it, like who captured it, what's it called? And then 20 minutes and 57 castles later, you aren't as curious. Uh, they are, they are pro-castle. The locals called it Castro Novo because it replaced an old Roman tower, we think. Uh, and everyone started frantically planting grapevines to sell to the papacy. They called it Vendu Pap. The popes would occasionally visit the vineyards and the village that was growing around the hill, and one of them, John XXII, liked it so much, he decided to commission a new castle on top of the hill. And once it was completed, it became the dominant structure in the area, eventually becoming the village's name, Chateauneuf. Now, here's what it looked like back in the day. It was quite the structure, but over time and the French Revolution, it got basically sold off for parts. By the 20th century, it was down to one tower, but at the end of World War II, the retreating Germans, who had been using it as an ammo depot, blew up the back of it. Now, for centuries, the village was actually known as chateauneuf Calcinier. Uh, Calcinier's were lime kilns, and more than wine, the town was known for its very fine lime, the material, not the fruit, uh, which happens when your region was geologically submerged for millions of years and you're sitting on reams of fossilized shellfish. Eventually, the village's wines became more famous, and the wine's name, Ben Dupap, became attached to the town's new name, chateauneuf du -Pape. Nowadays, chateauneuf du -Pape is just one of several iconic wine villages in the southern Rhone Valley. You've got Gigonda to the east, at the foot of the Dantel de Montmirey, and it's known for big, powerful, Grenache-based wines. Tavel, across the river from Chateauneuf, makes some of the most age-worthy rosés in the world. Uh, upcoming villages like Vaquera, Queran, Vin Sobre, Plan de Dieu, they all have their own special character, but because it puts Southern Rhone on the map, we're going to stay in Chateauneuf uh, and explore. So, this is a map of the appellation of Chateauneuf. Uh, established in the 1930s. There are many French farmers lost their voices arguing over these boundaries because within this line, you can call your wine chateauneuf du pape a more prestigious and expensive name, and outside, you have to call it Côte Rhone, which is a name that carries less weight and less price. All your grapes have to come from here, and there are more stringent rules inside this line. You can make reds, and you can make whites, but not rosé. You can't irrigate. You have to dry farm. Your reds are predominantly the grape varieties of Grenache, Syrah, Mourvedre, 
and occasionally saint so and a bunch of other grapes that you will never hear about again in your whole life. The whites are generally Roussanne, Grenache Blanc, Claret, and yada yada yada. Uh, for the reds, the Grenache vines have to be untrained bush vines in a style that's called gobelet because it's supposed to look like a, like a chalice. I think they look like uh, possessed little Tim Burton claws that are coming out of the ground because they want your soul. The minimum alcohol content in the reds is 12.5, which in a cooler world was sometimes difficult. This is no longer difficult. Uh, one of the calling cards of modern Chateauneuf is a higher alcohol content, often around 15%. Now to get that concentration, you have to have really small yields, meaning they have to cut off a lot of the grape bunches before ripening to increase the intensity of the remaining grapes. Chateauneuf controls this by limiting the grapes per acre that you can harvest. The maximum that you can harvest in Chateauneuf is actually half that of Bordeaux. Now you can use whatever barrels you want for aging, big, small, new ones, old ones. But since Grenache is prone to oxidization, you'll probably want to keep it in large, uh, big barrels uh, that the French call foudre, they're 5,000 liters, and then blend it with other varieties before bottling. The white Chateauneufs are more likely actually to be aged in smaller barrels like barriques. Whether or not a Chateau Neuf is ready to drink when you buy it is up to the producer and you. I'd say that the majority of Chateau Neuf is good to go upon release, but a handful of producers do make wines that need to lie down for a bit. Speaking personally, I don't age red Chateau Neufs longer than about 10 years past the harvest year because I don't want to lose that beautiful fruit that Grenache has. I don't age white Chateau Neufs at all. I mean, you can, I'm sure, but they taste too good and I don't let them age. Uh, if I ever end up with the aged Chateau Neuf, it's because I forgot that I had it. I actually went to Chateau Neuf in the surrounding area a few years ago. I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful time. You will never want to eat lamb again after that. Um, but I do recommend trying the wines of Chateau Neuf if you've never had them. Definitely go there, definitely taste the wines, and uh, we'll see you in the shop.